Hi, this is David Nyans with Worldwide Auctioneers. Today, we're thrilled to be with Mr. Ed Sowers, who's the Executive Director of the National Hudson Motor Car Company Museum. Thank you, David. Thanks for being with us today. Sure. We're talking about Hudson as a mark today, and this in front of this wonderful collection. And what makes you uh, such an ardent enthusiast for Hudson as a company, uh, as a manufacturer for the products and the cars? How far back does uh, Hudson go with you? Well, obviously, I love the cars. It started in my family in 1940 when my grandfather bought a new one. And we had nothing but Hudson's until the 70s. Uh, I drove a Hudson in college, back to high school days. That was my transportation. Wow, they were re fun. reliable. Uh, they were interesting, to say the least, interesting body styles. Uh, and that was kind of our thing. So uh, I cut my teeth on them and I've just continued to, to love and, and grow with that mark. Fantastic. So that's something, a you know, love of them that, and an and experience with them that you've shared with your entire family. Then. Yeah, and we still do. Nice. Family affair. I love it. That's what makes this hobby so great and why we do what we do. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what is it about Hudson uh, as a company or as a manufacturer that set them apart in your mind that makes them, makes Hudson what it is today that we all like to appreciate, and we're trying to get that out to people. Sure. Well, they were very well known from the very beginning as having great engineering. Okay. Uh, Howard Coffin was one of the original founders of the company. Uh, he was considered one of the great engineers of his time, and he was part of the foundation and part of that first car. And they continued with that kind of engineering clear up uh, through the 50s. Okay. So they they were actually very innovative and led the industry. Yeah, an example would be 1916, uh, the first balanced uh, crankshaft. Okay. You can imagine how important that would be to begin to build balance in the engine of a, of a car. And that, you know, innovation goes clear to today, the importance of, of balance. And thanks to popular entertainment, we're accustomed to how Hudson was revered as, as a race-winning mark, but that goes back long before, right, almost to the very beginning of the company, yeah. too. Hudson was competing in races and endurance races from the very beginning, in the teens. Uh, in 1932, they had a car entered in the Indianapolis 500. Okay. Uh, so, you know, history just kept going. And then at the beginning of NASCAR, uh, and they were the NASCAR champion in 51, 2, 3, and 4. There was no other car that uh, could really compete. And that was with a six-cylinder high-performance engine, uh, the twin-H engine, right. that actually uh, used a flathead technology, twin carburetors, and still went above and beyond the early V8 engines that uh, the big three were producing at that time yeah. by the early 50s. They were still sweeping uh, the, the NASCAR dirt tracks with... The Definitely. This, uh, and that's a, you know, a lot of engineering and a lot of design. Uh, after World War II, they came out with this step-down design, which you're used to today when you get in your car, you, you step down, down, right? Instead of up. And Hudson was the first production car to do that. But it kind of, it put the body below the frame and lowered the center of gravity. And when you're on a racetrack, uh, that means a lot. You've lowered the center of gravity of the car. You handle a lot um, better and go exactly. through the corners quicker. Great, great handling cars. If uh, you get into one of these Hudsons today, uh, phenomenal how well it drives. I, that's one thing that I, that I hear repeatedly from enthusiasts is that the step-down Hudsons from 1948 on, not only was that the first truly all-new um, car in America after the war, but it was also right from the beginning revered for its comfort and its safety features and uh, just the general driving experience. So uh, if you had a Hudson, in your driveway and by, at any point during that company's history. You were someone who was upwardly mobile, uh, knew what you liked to drive, and you liked to drive, and you wanted your family to be safe, comfortable, mm -hmm. and to have that style. They, Hudson was also um, very much involved in advancing styling and design, uh, how cars looked, not just how they ran, 
quite early on in their history as well. Uh, again, over, say, in Ford Motor Company, Edsel, uh, Henry Ford's son, had to convince Henry to start allowing him to style the cars and put designed in, in, into them rather than just reliability. Hudson was already doing this. Right. Uh, you know, a lot of good design, a lot of styling going into the Hudsons in the early years. And I think that the consumers, those willing to buy a Hudson, were willing to pay a little higher price for the additional uh, mechanical ability, the additional styling. Uh, so they, you know, they weren't a low-end car. Uh, this was a buy and hold kind it of. Uh, certainly was. Right. So you you would actually, again, you'd have to be someone who really had an eye for what you wanted, and Hudson was able to provide that in numerous ways. You mentioned the balanced crankshaft uh, that came along in 1916. Uh, I also understand that Hudson helped pioneer the use of um, what would become an automatic transmission with the electric and the Bendix system in the 30s. Um, so that was quite sophisticated. Eight and six cylinder engines with plenty of power and lots of, um, especially in the, in, in, by the 30s, a lot of really great Art Deco streamlining. Right. right. Yeah, just some beautiful cars, uh, you know, from 29, on, right? I know that's all a matter of preference and taste or what do you like, you know, but uh, just some beautiful works of art. Absolutely. They also had coach built bodies by Murphy, uh, Biddle and Smart, uh, which they Hudson had collaborated with that company quite, um, uh, quite closely right. uh, in the 20s and, and I think into the 30s. Am I right on that? that? You're correct. They, uh, you know, fairly low production. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not a lot of those built. Again, expensive cars. Uh, but, you know, to have one of those today is a pretty special Hudson. Now, Hudson was, as we mentioned <coughs> earlier, traditionally, right from the beginning, very much involved in motorsports and racing as a way to improve the safety, the engineering of their cars, how they worked, how they, how they performed on the road. Um, so they were really into the idea of winning on Sunday and selling on Monday uh, in the showrooms very much from the start. Um, I believe from 1911 we have an example here of a mile a minute speedster, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot today, and I'm sure those cars were capable of more, but to run in 1911 uh, with a basic production car chassis and, and, and powertrain in a lightweight body, uh, to be able to travel at high speeds reliably for hours or days at a time. That was kind of how motorsports evolved, I, from my understanding, as well as competitive racing. Then we have Hudson being primarily known today for its uh, NASCAR dominance during the early 1950s. How did Hudson, kind of their engineering and their approach to racing and competition for such a, a high-end mark to be involved in racing as well? How did that progress uh, from through the 10s, the 20s, the 30s, the yeah. 40s? Well, I think they knew it's great publicity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the newspaper picked that up. Uh, you know, wherever they could get it for free was a wonderful thing. That's right. Any car company, right? So uh, produce a mile a minute speedster, uh, run mail from uh, U.S. mail from okay. the East Coast to the West Coast and see how quickly you could get it there. Right, setting uh, records and dis setting time records, distance records. Right, in the 30s doing uh, the Pikes Peak climb. Okay, and that was winning, huge. you know, with their new Hudson uh, Terraplane eight cylinder, uh, running Pikes Peak and, and kind of winning that and setting records there. And they called the Terraplane the Hillbuster, from right. my understanding, in marketing. So they were, right. they took that those achievements and they actually yeah. here's translated a, that to advertising and marketing. Here's a powerful car, here's a fast car, here's a, here's a car that'll hold the hill, uh, you know, so that, that just kept going. And, and they were able to keep that momentum going right through the Great Depression years too. Yeah. Uh, regardless of whether sales were up or down, Hudson seemed to be able to prosper and progress um, rather than scaling back like some great companies did during the 30s. So again, motorsports was, again, one of the tools they used to yeah. propel them. When NASCAR started, it, okay. it wasn't all about the kind of sponsorships that we might see today. I mean, the automotive companies weren't sponsoring cars. 
you'd go buy your car and you would go race. Hudson was the first company to kind of enter that market okay. as a sponsor. So, so they, they seized on that and uh, on a popular racing series and actually right. tied, so, tied their wagon to that basically. So if you were a driver, you could go to Hudson. If you were a top driver like Marshall Teague or Herb Thomas, okay. then they'd give you a car. And that was pretty much the extent of your sponsorship, all right? But at least you didn't have to provide your own. Uh, that's, and, uh, that's an a plus and, when you're but, trying to race. But Hudson used that, you know, had those guys tied in and used that in marketing uh, up to 54 when Hudson was really hot on the track. I mean, you, you couldn't beat it. Well, Hudson actually, uh, to my understanding, had sort of that equivalent of a dream, that era's equivalent of a dream team. They had top drivers, Herb Thomas, uh, Marshall Teague, uh, Smokey Eunuch from Daytona Beach was actually involved in helping put mechanic, that deal together, right. to my understanding. And he was the team mechanic and uh, prepped the cars. Mm -hmm. So you had some of the greatest people uh, involved in that project from the beginning. And then at the factory, my understanding is the man uh, who helped Chevrolet get on the map as, uh, years later in the 60s with their racing program, Vince Piggins, he was the engineer that put together the uh, severe usage parts program and got into providing the high performance parts that were available for the Hornets so you could go racing or if you wanted to clean up on the street. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly. And I guess it's no surprise then that uh, Disney or Pixar movies picks a Hudson Hornet to be part of the very first Cars movie, right? Oh, that was I fantastic. Mean, it was authentic. I mean, well done. Well, what you hear about the Hudson Hornet in the Cars movie is exactly right. So if you're a Hudson enthusiast, you see the smile on my face now, right? If you're a Hudson enthusiast uh, and you look at that and you see the reality of it, and it just kind of brings the 50s back to today. Great, and, great memories. And kids today, I mean, young kids up to, you know, kids my, uh, my children in their 30s kind of remember growing up with the Cars movie. Oh, I think it's brilliant because now you're bringing up a whole new generation of people mm -hmm. who are will be coming into adulthood or are already young adults and they can start enjoying the classic car hobby and especially with a quality car that's got racing lineage and brilliant engineering, great styling yeah. and then sadly is long gone now and, and due to mergers and acquisitions in the 50s uh, but people can now relate back in time and enjoy the hobby through Hudson and also the passion of the people like you, um, the collectors, the restorers the historians, people who really love motorsports or automobiles. So now we can look forward to a new generation to enjoy these cars. What is the opportunity here in your eyes as far as uh, now that, that the time has come to sell the cars and for them to find new homes and, and enthusiasts to enjoy them? Well, this is the best Hudson collection in the world. I mean, there's you know, bar none, there's Hands no down. doubt about that. That's right. And to walk through these cars again today and, and to see them and, you know, just memories from the very beginning of the company to the end of the company. It's just been a fantastic uh, experience again. So, you know, from one perspective, you kind of hate to see them get out in a way, 
but from another perspective, there are lots of people like me that will have an opportunity to get one of these cars, enjoy it in a whole new way, understand all the features that we've been talking about, and you know, maybe create something new for their family. That's right. That's a huge opportunity, and it's something we're really looking forward to. And I think that that's the best we can hope for, is that new people are going to join the hobby or increase their involvement and increase the knowledge out there of Hudson, what it's, you know, what it's meant to people, and what it could mean in the future. Thanks for being here with us today. It was really great to talk to you. It's good to be here. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.